this opportunity to the organizers to uh, present on behalf of the, the food and agriculture sectors. I'm uh, very happy to be here. And I appreciate the opportunity to change gears a little bit and to start talking about animals and plants and the environment a little bit. So first off, I, um, we know, we all know that antimicrobial resistance is a very complex issue. It requires a multi-sectoral approach. We heard it this morning that we all have a role to play. And I think that um, this, this first slide has a really good depiction of how um, all, of, all of these different sectors interact, um, especially within the broader context of the environment. So I'll take a couple minutes just to go through this um, slide and see if I can. So if we start off, um, the primary introduction of a lot of our uh, antimicrobial resistance into the environment is going to be through our application of antimicrobials to people and to animals and to plants. Um, also, other areas that were mentioned previously this morning was in terms of pharmaceutical production companies as well. And we'll also see that uh, in a bit that there's some other drivers as well. But we'll focus for now on the um, applications to people and animals. So let's, in the upper left hand corner, I won't try to find. Um, so we know that antimicrobials are being used. Um, in animals, not just in production animals, and companion animals too, another area that we don't often talk about, but we know that companion animals are in very close contact with people, so there's a potential risk there as well. But in terms of in production animals, we have many different types of animals that uh, receive antimicrobials. So we have sort of the traditional terrestrial um, production animals, so poultry, uh, swine, cattle, we have our aquaculture animals, um, and these can be quite varied, many different types of fish, and mollusks, and shrimp. So it's a very complicated um, sector. And we know that a uh, proportion of antimicrobials that are administered to people and animals are excreted un unmetabolized uh, through waste, so through feces and urine, and that's where we're seeing introductions into the environment. So it can be uh, directly in introduced to the environment, into the soils, for example, if you have a free-ranging dog, um, they're going to be going out anywhere. And so you're going to have that, that direct introduction into soils. Um, it can also be um, through, through water, uh, through urine, through um, the waste system. And in that case, it'll be going to our wastewater treatment plants where it can either biodegrade or it can absorb to sewage sludge, which will then eventually, could eventually be transmitted uh, or to uh, be distributed onto crops as um, fertilizer. It can also be uh, excreted in the effluent that would go into our rivers and our, our lakes. We also have antimicrobials being uh, given to aquaculture, which obviously they're directly in contact with water. And then we also know that antimicrobials can be um, applied to crops. We'll talk about that a little bit more. That's not demonstrated so clearly in this diagram. Um, but we're trying to tr get a better understanding at FAO of the amount of antimicrobials being used in plant production, especially plants that are intended for food. And there's also a role for wildlife in terms of being able to transmit antimicrobial resistance organisms and um, being a mechanical vector as well. So a very complex system, and as you can imagine, trying to control antimicrobial resistance in the environment is very complex. And so the more that we can control the the antimicrobials being introduced into that environment, the better. So again, prevention is going to be much easier if we can try to reduce the overall use of antimicrobials in people and animals and in plants. In terms of moving on to uh, animal production, we have an, we're seeing an increase in the consumption of terrestrial and aquatic animal products. And this is associated, associated with the increasing global population, as well as the improved economies. We're seeing an increase in per capita consumption of eggs and different meat products such as poultry, beef, uh, lamb, etc. Likewise, we're seeing an increase in demand for fish products, uh, especially those of, uh, in aquaculture as opposed to uh, wild capture. But again, all, all associated with that increasing demand um, from increasing global populations and improved economies. And associated with the increase in demand, we're going to have an increase in animal production. 
And we're also seeing with this increase in demand in production, a change in the types of systems that are taking place. So where we used to have more extensive farming systems, we're now moving to an intensive system, which has a lot of associated issues with it. You have more animals in smaller confinements. It's going to be associated with easier ways that easier mechanisms for disease to be transmitted, higher levels of stress, um, and other types of issues associated with hygiene and biosecurity. Um, so it's really difficult to know exactly how much antimicrobials are being used in food animal production. Uh, there's many different estimates out there. This represents one that was recently published by Dan Beckel, um, in which they estimated the amount of antimicrobials being used by a uh, country in terrestrial food production. And it, the estimate for 2013 was that there was about 130,000 tons being used. And if there's no changes made to what we're doing now, that estimate is expected to um, increase by 65% by 2030 to be over 200,000. Um, tons of use. Antimicrobials, however, are they're used in different ways in animal production. So they're used for treatment of disease. And that's essential. We need to have those antimicrobials available. Because if we don't have healthy animals, we're not going to have healthy food. So there, there is a need for it. Because we often get asked, why can't we just go to banning the use of all antimicrobials in livestock or in animal productions. And ideally, sure, that would be great, but that, that's a long-term goal, because if we take away our antimicrobials now, we're gonna have this vacuum created where diseases can proliferate and we're not gonna be able to treat them, we're not gonna have those animals as a healthy food source, and the livelihoods of those people that depend on raising those animals is going to be taken away. So it's got to be a stepwise approach. We need to do it in conjunction with improving our practices, um, our different agricultural practices. They're also used for prevention, as was mentioned earlier, which um, can mean a lot of different things. The definitions of pre prevention is a, sort of a heated topic. Um, so it could be where um, people that have been using it for growth promotion, if you're suddenly taking that away, they'll say it's for prevention. But really, prevention should be for when there is a um, high risk of disease, and your antimicrobial treatment is for a specific amount of time and targeted towards a specific known disease. Um, so in some cases, it could be a few animals in a herd are getting sick, and you want to keep the other animals in the herd from getting sick. Or if you know that there's going to be a high risk setting where an animal is at risk for a known disease, whether it's in a certain production stage or in a high stress situation such as transportation. Um, but again, it's going to be at therapeutic levels for a set duration and targeting a set uh, disease. And we do know that they are still being used for growth promotion, so helping to try to get animals at a higher weight quicker. And the World Organization for Animal Health has started trying to track the sale of antimicrobials used um, in, in animals. And we know from their last report that 40% of the countries that reported out of 146 are still using antimicrobials for growth promotion. And this is considered an unnecessary use because it's not being used for animal health or animal welfare. Um, but again, it's still being done. And the reasons for that is in some countries it's approved for use for growth promotion. And in some cases, there just isn't a regulatory framework that is prohibiting that use. We also know that antimicrobials are being used in plant production. Um, this is often an area that's, that's overlooked, and this sector tends to um, be forgotten about, especially when developing national action plans. But in, we, we don't know to what extent. Um, it seems, it's assumed to be very little, but in some cases, in some countries, especially in low-middle income countries, there could still be um, that access to antimicrobials and they could still be being used. We've um, tried to estimate um, how many countries are still, are, have antimicrobials approved for use in plant production. Um, we still have some preliminary results of the survey, and we know that it's at least in 20 out of like 85 countries. Um, but we, that was a fairly small um, response rate, so we still don't know kind of beyond that how much it's being used. 
But a lot of the, some of the antimicrobials that are used in plant production are also used in human and animal health. So streptomycin, tetracycline, genomycin, um, and the triazoles for some of the fungal infections, where there has been some associated um, some associations with uh, transfer to fungal infections to people. On the environment, again, we need clean water and healthy soils for healthy food production. So we know antimicrobials and resistance genes can contribute to antimicrobial resistance. Also biocides, so the detergents that are used in different facilities can also contribute to resistance through co-selection or cross-resistance and some of the metals that can be used in animal feed. Um, and low levels of these different residues can select for resistance. And there's a lack of standard methodologies and surveillance in this area, so there's still a lot that we need to know to really understand the risk of EMR to human and animal health. So how do we preserve efficacy? Um, again, it's not just even for health, but also for food safety and food security. And again, a, a lot of our focus is trying on, on reducing that use, focusing on the prevention. So making sure there's awareness at all levels, from the farmers all the way up to policymakers, building evidence through surveillance to help guide those interventions and monitor progress. So again, this is something that was mentioned earlier, having that information, knowing what are the most common diseases, what are the trends in resistance, so that we can give really good uh, treatment prescription guidelines to those different um, animal health workers. We need to focus on and invest in good production practices, again, to reduce need. So this can be a range of different things, from biosecurity, improving hygiene, having good nutrition, access to affordable and um, quality vaccines, as well as um, access to quality and rapid diagnostics. Also, the, the field of alternatives to antimicrobials is an area where we've been very hopeful to find some that could uh, be substitutes for antimicrobials, particularly for growth promotion. Um, but the efficacy of those tend not to be the same as for antimicrobials. So there's still a lot more to look at in terms of combining these different um, practices to try to be able to, to replace the use of growth promotion with other actions that could still not have an impact on the um, productivity for the farmers. And then integrated pest management, particularly in the case of uh, plant production. So things such as selecting for, for breeds of plants that are resistant to diseases, <coughs> crop rotation, use of bioactional project products, um, etc. We need to phase out the use of growth antimicrobials for growth promotion, but again, we can't do that suddenly because, again, that will impact on our, the livelihoods and food security, but we need to do it in con conjunction with improving good practices. We need to strengthen regulatory frameworks and oversight on all issues associated with antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance, and we need to promote research and innovation to build evidence for economically viable changes in behaviors, pra products, and practices. And again, we need to continue working in a One Health approach because we all have a role to play and working on it together is going to be a lot more uh, efficient. Yeah. Thank you.